departments in the world of science. I, um, I was a vision scientist. Now I consider myself an imaging scientist with a focus in human vision, right? But um, it's been a, a long, strange journey. And uh, today, uh, in my time here, I've begun a line of work focusing on the study of eye trackers, their hardware and the software algorithms that, are, that allow you to map, um, to estimate gaze direction. And I'm gonna speak to you about that today, okay? So uh, I'm gonna give a talk about the current and evolving state of head-mounted eye tracking using frame-based and event-based sensors and what that distinction will become more clear towards uh, the end of my talk, what a frame versus event-based sensor is. So before I start talking about current and uh, eye tracking and the future of eye tracking, I want to give you guys some context. Again, I've said I've been here for about 10 years. And just before I came here, when I was still really uh, more of a vision scientist, I was studying my research focused on how humans use vision to guide action. And I'm still kind of, to be quite honest, in um, uh, I wear two hats, right? I wear this eye tracking research hat and this human vision hat where I study visually guided action. So during my postdoc, before I came here, I was doing, I was engaged in one line of research at UT Austin when I was working in a lab of Mary Hayhoe. And I want to tell you about this because it provides context. This is a video from that. We were doing some of the first studies using virtual reality to study eye movements. And I'm not going to get far deep into the questions we were asking, the hypotheses we we're testing, but I'm going to show you some of the a representation of the type of stuff we were doing. So this is a view inside a VR headset back then. This is data was collected around 2010. And you know, the participants task was just hit this virtual racquetball at the center of the X, the center of the target, right? And what we're really interested in is how eye movements were supporting movements of the racket, right? The visually guided action of timing and placing that swing. You, said, I would have described it this way back then, but nowadays I'd say we're trying to reverse engineer the human imaging system to understand what information was guiding movements. The crosshair wasn't visible to the person in the headset. That's something we got um, because an eye tracker was attached to the headset. And through uh, a lot of hard work, I was able to produce an estimate of that gaze direction. Here's the headset we were using to collect that data. I have one of these headsets under a desk in my lab. Back then and, and now, I, I, whenever I show this thing, I, we had a nickname for it. It was called the ergonomic nightmare. Because it's really front heavy. They actually had to add a metal plate in the back so it wouldn't slide too far forward, just increase the weight of the whole thing. And then I want you to see th these two little cups down there. Those are actually the eye tracker. They involved hot glue, Velcro, rubber-coated copper wire, and then you can see that's a little IR LED. Um, so anytime a student in my lab complains about how difficult it is to use common eye trackers, yes, I'm looking at you, Ariana. I have, <laughs> yes, I have to remind them. I had a, an attrition rate of like 50% of the participants who came to my lab, meaning I, it was very hard to get usable data. And either it worked or it didn't. And so we've come a long way. Um, so now it's, that was around 2010, right? It's 2023. Um, in the t that time, I've seen many, many uh, companies enter and leave the eye tracking segments of the VR market and, and mobile eye tracking market. These are some examples of companies and products that have come and gone. The HCC no longer supports eye tracking right off the bat. I, I hear they're trying to sell an, an, an attachment. The HP Omnicept was a hot flash in a pan. That's their, I'm not sure if HP will release another VR headset that had eye tracking by Toby. We've got a few options now, but it's really, let me just put it this way, it's not where I thought it would be. Things have been moving slowly and there isn't yet a plug and play solution. Um, even yesterday I was approached by an entrepreneur who's interested in integrating eye tracking into their future product for rehabilitation of a visual disorder. And my advice was we're not there yet because there's no plug and play solution you can put on someone's head that will estimate gaze and work reliably across a large segment of the population without a lot of fiddling and uh, hard work. And so um, there are lots of us trying to improve the situation. And today I'm going to present a history of our efforts to improve the accuracy, precision, and robustness of present day 
XR integrated eye trackers. I'm really, uh, XR integrated is a little more specific. Um, I'll, actually, let me focus on the word R first. Let me just say, uh, all the work I'm presenting today is largely collaborative. Some of my collaborators in the audience today, not just grad students, but faculty. Jeff is here, thanks, Jeff. Um, and uh, and uh, I just want to acknowledge it. I, I try to acknowledge this throughout the presentation, but it's so collaborative, it's hard to keep up. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about our work on mobile and XR integrated eye trackers. In order to do that, first you have to understand what the hardware is like. And whether it's a VR integration or something you wear in your head, a mobile eye tracker, it does imply that you're wearing it on your head and it moves with you. Um, most mobile eye trackers today are going to have a few pieces of hardware. They're going to have two integrated eye cameras, one per eye, and there's going to be a little IR infrared LED next to it. We use infrared uh, illumination because everyone's eye tends to look fairly similar under infrared because if I shine a bright infrared light near your eye, your pupil doesn't constrict a lot, right? And on, honestly, because of, for historical reasons, um, it would be wonderful if I could collaborate with some, for example, hyperspectral imaging folks and figure out whether that's really the right source of illumination, something I've been thinking about for a long time. In addition to the eye cameras, there's always going to be uh, either an outward facing world camera, if this is supposed to be like a pair of glasses, right, to, mon to map gaze onto what the person is seeing as they're walking around the world. Or um, if you're in VR, everything's the same, except instead of an outward facing world camera, um, you're just going to scrape the image off the virtual, uh, what the person sees inside the virtual display. You're going to take a digital snapshot of the image. You can see that in this VR headset, there's still two eye cameras. There would be an infrared illuminant next to them. The, uh, in this case, the illuminants are around the, the optics of the VR display. Okay. So um, that's the hardware of most contemporary eye trackers. Here's a video I collected a year ago, two years ago. When did we take this class? Um, a year ago. Uh, it's advanced imaging. You might notice this room's upstairs. Um, Sorry, this is advanced eye tracking, and I taught this course to graduate students here at RIT. So we explored algorithms, hardware and algorithms for eye tracking. Um, we collected data, we analyzed it. If you are about to be a fourth year undergraduate, or if you are a second or, or, or a graduate student that's interested in taking an elective, I, I should offer this course in the next year or two, and uh, feel free to send me an email. But listen, um, I'm showing you that we collected this data on day one of the class, and I'm showing it to you so you get an idea of what it looks like. I'm about to hit play. Um, before I do, this, is, this little dot is going to be an approximation of where the person's looking when I hit record. And these two eye images are uh, the input to the system, right? I forgot the tennis ball I meant to bring, so we're throwing my wallet around. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Luckily, it's a soft wallet, but this is the moment where all my credit cards fall out. <laughs> there we go. Um, so you can see in the top left, right? The reason I'm showing you this uh, this recording from a Pupil Labs mobile eye tracker is to give you the impression of, of what's going on here. Um, in terms of software, of course, the input is just this time series of infrared eye images. And the first step in the eye tracking pipeline is to identify, track, segment, localize, however you want to call it, um, any feature that it, whose movement through the eye image is going to correlate, to correspond, to have a mathematical relationship to changes in gaze direction in a real world, right? So of course, as your pupil moves through this image, it tells you something. It has some stable relationship to the change in, your, in the uh, angle of your gaze vector. So the the, the, the steps in a canonical pipeline then are collect the image, right, infrared image, identify an eye, an eye feature in this, uh, this system, it's tracking the pupil centroid, right? And how it moves to the eye image. And then pass that through a mathematical operation that maps it onto a change in gaze angle. We're gonna focus less on that mat last mathematical operation of producing a gaze mapping today and more on the step of feature detection. Because if you do a bad job tracking that feature, everything else after that is going to be inaccurate, right? Step one is to do a good job tracking that feature. And to motivate how important that step is, I want to show you, um, now this image won't change. You just saw this. 
But here I want to focus on the I image. First, before I hit play, I'm going to point out that um, there is a spatial temporal trade off of these systems. Basically, you can either, uh, the eyes move really, really quickly, right? And a saccade can move up to 500 degrees a second. Saccades are about 50 milliseconds to a, um, a long one, can be closer to 100 milliseconds, but say typical. So um, for that reason, because the eye moves so quickly, we want to be able to get a lot of images per second. This eye camera works at 200 hertz, but that means it's transmitting a lot of pixels through that USB cable. Don't forget, there are two eyes, so it's actually 400 hertz for the whole system. In order to um, not hit some bottlenecks in not just USB transfer limits, but also processing limits, we have to reduce the spatial accuracy and compensation. There's a spatial temporal trade-off. So this is a low resolution eye image so that it can collect at 200 Hertz. Not only is it low resolution, only 192 by 192, I want to point out that the pupil doesn't move across a whole image. So if the pupil is only moving through, uh, I, I don't know exactly how many pixels this, this is. Let's say it's about 100 by 100 pixels, this red square. Um, then that means we're mapping from about, a, let's say, 100 pixels along the horizontal to, uh, if we wanted to map gaze across this whole image right here, the horizontal um, resolution is 1280. Think about that scaling. From, that's a 10 to 1 scaling. So that means one pixel of error here would produce more than a pixel, uh, uh, more than, um, sorry, it's 103 degrees, actually, it's more relevant, 103 degrees of visual angle across the horizontal. So one pixel of error would produce more than one visual degree of error in the gaze mapping, right? That's if we wanted to map gaze across a whole image. We typically can't do that for other reasons, but it gives you, an, I'm trying to give you an impression now of why every pixel of accuracy matters when tracking that pupil. One small bit of error is going to produce a large, uh, over here is going to produce a large amount of inaccuracy over here. Now, this is a really nice eye image. The problem gets much harder if you try and take the mobile eye tracker out of indoors into the real world. Why is that? Well, because first of all, you get a lot of ambient illumination. And second of all, um, if you actually try and put these eye trackers on a, a wide variety of people and different face types and different eye types, you get a lot of different types of occlusion. So um, Wolfgang Fuhl and his colleagues uh, in 2016 published a, a paper in which they took a look at the difficulties in tracking something like the pupil um, under normal circumstances. And here they had people do a driving task. You see all these reflections from the windshield, right? Because there's a lot of ambient infrared light in the real world. Here they had to do a visual search task in the supermarket. These are some of the frames where the pupil was, was difficult to track. Um, and then there are also um, Eastern Asian cultures. Uh, people often have epicanthal folds, which is a different type of eye and often will result in more occlusion of the pupil than without epicanthal fold. And so if I release a product, it might not work over a large swath of the population. It would work less well. And that is a real problem. So these are the challenges in developing a, in, in solving, a, producing a good feature tracker that works across all sorts of environments and peoples. So it was in 2019 that I first became very interested in this problem. And that is largely because of our really motivated graduate students. In 2019, we had a collection of students who, um, oh, before I get there, in 2019, a collection of students recognize an opportunity. So this citation here is not from RIT. This is from, uh, so what happened is Facebook produced a challenge. They recognized that pupil tracking was important too. Feature detection was important. And so uh, the using traditional computer vision techniques to solve this problem, sorry, using traditional, uh, yeah, computer vision, image processing techniques, it, it makes this really hard. Um, no one had been using machine learning up until this point because the data sets didn't exist to train the networks. In 2019, Facebook produced the data sets we would need to start using machine learning to solve this problem. And of course, many of you have already been asking, well, you probably wondered, is this really that hard, right? Um, so yes, in a real world, it can be hard, but it's given what we can do with machine learning, you'd think this would be an easy problem to solve. That's only true if you have the data sets. In 2019, Facebook produced what's called the OpenEDS uh, data set. So what you see here is an image pair 
um, each two images is the original uh, uh, eye image collected by Facebook. And what they did is they had 152 participants, probably interns, um, label almost 13,000 images. And they labeled in every image the pupil, uh, the boundary between the pupil and the iris, the boundary between the iris and the sclera, and then the boundary between the sclera and the rest of the face. So a lot of hand labeling. A lot of poor interns thought they'd be doing much more interesting work. OK. Um, they released this and held a machine learning challenge. And this is where now now is the appropriate time to credit our graduate students. They heard about this challenge. They just finished up another line of work. Several of them happened or, um, happened to have a break in their schedule kind of at the same time that I think Jeff and I, who were their collective advisors, and, and Rennie Bailey were all um, going to a conference at the same time. And so the students conspired and said, please, Gabe, Please, Jeff, can we please enter this contest? Give us a month. Our students won the competition against 30 competitors or 30 uh, from the industry and other academic institutions. Um, that was Ayush Chadari, Rakshit Kothari, Modish uh, Achaya, um, Dangi, uh, uh, Dangi, Nair, and, and, and the rest are just boring faculty. Sorry. And Chris Kanan, Chris Kanan, yep, he was involved too. Um, so it was a large multi-laboratory effort of students who just really identified an opportunity and, and you know, stars aligned, we were able to let them do it, follow their dream. So, the, uh, so what they did is uh, they trained a network to segment these eye images. RITnet, um, it's on the bottom. You can see that the baseline network went against which they were um, uh, competing and they, they crushed that, but they also crushed all the other 30 institutions. Crushed is maybe the wrong word here, actually. Next slide. First, let me tell you how they evaluated, we evaluated our uh, performance. A common metric of machine learning to evaluate performance of a segmentation like network like this is called intersection over union or IOU. And it's just the ratio of the combined area of these two circles over the area of overlap. So this is an IOU of zero if the ground truth is over here and the estimation is over here. This is an IOU of about 0.5, and this representation has an IOU of about 0.952, which was our best score. I'm gonna point out that the next best score is 0.951. So we won by a thousandth of an IOU. It was that one image we decided to include the last minute in the training data set, one image. So um, first of all, let me just point out that I, although this competition was incredibly rewarding for the students um, and, and us, of course, we ended up getting meta funding shortly after this, we, after we won the competition, we spoke to them, and that has been really helpful. Um, this was a competition that I believe really encouraged people to overfit their model to the training data. And to this day, we see consequences of that, and that will be a recurring theme in the rest of my talk, that our students did really well training a model to win this competition, not necessarily to train a model that would work um, outside of this narrow context. Here's an example. Uh, this is in Jeff's lab, which is now Dima's lab. Um, and you can see Ayush, who now works at Apple. He worked for Microsoft for a hot minute before they dissolved their eye tracking team, literally for a month or so, poor guy. And then luckily, he's so good, he got a job at Apple without much trouble. Dr. Pels. So what you're seeing here is the application of that network applied to a domain that it was not trained for. So this is a generalization, an example of failure to generalize, if you ask me. It didn't do horribly. Um, you can see that it's doing all right at recognizing a pupil, but clearly other boundaries are, are flickering or disappearing. It's, it's not great. Um, so the if it performed this poorly in a competition, I don't think we would have won. So the issue is that when we trained the network, we used a set of images that does not closely resemble, in some way, does not closely resemble this test case, right? We overfit the data to the, um, to the conditions of the, uh, of the competition. So here's the issue. If we want to solve this problem of generalization, well, I'm looking for interns, right? Um, come on over to my lab. And um, 
nobody wants to label 13,000 images, especially if you're a company and you're producing new products every few years. That means you have to label 13,000 new images and train a new net network, presumably, every free few years, depending on how well, if this generalization problem persists, right? So we have to start thinking um, about ways, and these are just images from a, a publication where you know people were hand labeling the pupil and the iris. Think about how many points per image you have to meti meticulously click on and now remind yourself that one pixel of error will degrade the quality of your track. So if you don't spend the time to click carefully, you're going to produce a poor um, feature detection algorithm that's slightly inaccurate. You need to do a really great job. So the question is, if we want to avoid labeling 13,000 images every time we change something about the eye tracker, for example, we move the camera location or change something about the illuminance, then uh, um, then how do, well, how do we avoid that? How do we avoid labeling all the images? And so I'm going to tell you about two different approaches we took as a, as a group of collaborators to try and avoid um, labeling all these images every time and solve this problem in a way that's sustainable. Um, the first one is we tried to use computer graphics to produce a, to create a pipeline that would allow us to produce a lot of images quickly. We call this RITIs. It's been through several iterations of improvement. What you can see here are a collection of synthetic RGB images of human eyes. And then the bottom row is a group of uh, infra fake infrared images of human eyes. In the bottom right, you can see that because these are computer generated images, one of the perks of that is that we can we know at the pixel level what category is being represented by every pixel. So we know which pixels are pupil, iris, and sclera. And we know that even if there's occlusion, right? We know what's where the eyeball is underneath the skin. Um, so this allows us, this is a critical part of training a machine learning network to segment, right? You can't just pass in the eye images just like in our in um, just like with the data set that. Facebook produced, they didn't just produce eye images, they produced those ground truth labels. You guys have learned about supervised machine learning, right? 99% of all networks are supervised machine learning, where you pass in the eye image, but you have to pass in the answer too for, um, for optimal segmentation, right? So here's an example. We've converted in later iterations, we've, uh, updated the pipeline so that it can produce sequences of images, movies. Um, and I'll be the first to acknowledge that this synthetic, so this is a real image in the top left and synthetics in the top right. I'll be the first to acknowledge that it's clearly in the uncanny valley, right? That looks a little creepy. It's a few years old. We've improved things. But um, again, if you're thinking about generalization, that could be a problem. Now before, here are a bunch of image pairs. The real image is on the left, the synthetic is on the right, but I wanna point out one thing. We did not attempt to match uh, every aspect of appearance, um, but eye camera geometry, eye pose, and eyelid pose were recovered using computer vision. Why didn't we attempt to match every aspect of appearance? Because that would kind of defeat the point. If we're just trying to create synthetic images that replicate uh, a pool of real world images we already have for training our supervised for training our models in a supervised manner, then we've added nothing to the data set. We did it really well, right? What we want to do is allow for variation in appearance in our, in our synthetic images that will broaden any training data set. So it'll capture more variation in the, in the natural, in the, uh, in the real world. So the question is, so um, this pipeline is now capable of generating hundreds of thousands of images overnight of synthetic images, right? Um, and the goal, of course, is to then train a network using these synthetic images and the ground truth pairings um, to train a network to segment so that when we pass in real eye images, it will produce a good segmentation of that real eye image and improve eye tracking, right? We can prototype new eye trackers, do all sorts of wonderful things. So the core question here is, how well does it generalize? If we train a model using synthetic images, and then try and apply the model to real eye images? And the answer is it doesn't generalize very well. We're still stuck in this problem. So here's some data to back up that point. Here is, um, on the x-axis, we have the number of images included in a training data set for the segmentation model, segment, trained to segment just pupils. 
On the y-axis, we have this IOU, a measure of IOU. It's MIOU means it's the mean IOU over all the categories, um, pupil, sclera, iris. And uh, the blue line represents performance using only real images. And you can see it plateaus very quickly, starts off very, uh, so the idea here is we trained the model using um, less than 5,000, let's say, real images up to something like 8,000 real images. And then we tested it on a bunch of real eye images that weren't included during training. And the IOUs uh, close to 95%, right? Or, um, when we train it with up to 15,000 synthetic images, we're barely above 65. And this hump you see is indicative of overtraining, overfitting the model to synthetic images. So our best performance actually occurred with a much smaller number of synthetic images. But it doesn't get anywhere near the performance using real images. And although I'm not going to show you the data, I can tell you that if we combine synthetic and real images, and we include only a small number of real images, performance is almost completely driven by the real images. Adding 15,000 synthetic images to a few thousand real images does not improve performance above this value. It really has no effect. The model just learns to pay attention to the real images and ignore the synthetic ones. It's a problem. So our effort of using synthetic images to train the model that would then be applied to real images did not seem to pan out. Uh, yeah, what's up, Jim? Okay, so some percentage of the data set is going to be the eyes in, not the training data set, but the testing data set will be when the eye is doing something like blinking, right? Where we would expect it to be way off and fail. Um, so I don't know if I have a good answer for that question. I don't know if, I, I don't remember that we looked at that. Jeff, do you have a recollection? I know we decided we needed both, right? We asked the same question. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Short answer is there were big failures. There were one instance of failure. I think it's closer to failure. So that's with real images. With synthetic images, I think there was a wider, there's a lot more room for failure of all sorts. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, John. Yeah. Yes, it would. Um, it would. Uh, and uh, there are reasons, one of the reasons why we're training our segmentation network on multiple classes beyond the pupil is so it can guide this kind of synthetic image generation, right? So um, by tracking where the sclera ends and the skin begins, that allows us to, to extract the pose of the eyelids. So if, I don't remember, I think this video didn't show the eyelids moving, but yeah, it does. Okay, so our model does recover the eyelid shape and apply that to the recreation of the eye pose. Um, yeah, yeah. Please. I think part of it is that the current systems that we're trying to test this in rely very heavily on the It's part of this work, this workforce system that is going to be Um, one last question before we move on. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Thanks. Um, do you mind holding to, since I'm in the middle of the talk, I'd rather come back at the end. Is it is a question that's very relevant to this very particular portion of the talk? Okay, go ahead. What's up? Uh, 
So let me continue with the talks head in that direction. Great. Okay. So um, there we do fine tuning. And I'm going to skip around. I'm going to answer your question kind of briefly and skip some slides because for the sake of time, so I can get through towards the end of the talk, which is the stuff I, I definitely want to talk about. Um, yes, the answer is yes. We've played in several ways with transfer learning and with pruning the training data set in intelligent ways, in, in data-driven ways to improve the likelihood that our synthetic trained model would generalize to real images. One way we did this was we passed our original eye images through an autoencoder. The benefit of this is the network has an hourglass shape, so it's reducing the image uh, representation and then reconstructing it. And that means that somewhere in the middle, it's got a reduced dimensional representation of our entire pool of images, um, which is to say, it's a really fancy way of dimensionality reduction. If you've got a pool of images, you can pass them all in through a network like this, an autoencoder, and it's a way of, kind of like principal components analysis, is a way of dimensionality reduction. Um, so what we can do is actually take that low dimensional representation and further reduce it in dimensionality by using principal components analysis. Um, and the summary of that, if you don't know what I just said, is that we can use data reduction techniques to summarize all where all these images lie in an abstract two-dimensional space. What does each dimension represent? No idea, but it captures the most variation we can possibly capture in this pool of images, right? Um, Sometimes this is useful. And so what, what allows us to do is compare all the images within this reduced dimensional space um, that were in the original data set and with our best attempt to recreate it using synthetic images. You notice that there's a portion of overlap and then there's a bunch of synthetic images that are apparently not very much like the original data set. And this is one way that we might use, one representation or approach that we might use to uh, select which synthetic images are realistic. Okay, so um, just a quick thing. Uh, I wish we had more time to talk about this, but uh, most of you are imaging science students, right? I want you to think about this offline. Um, you've probably learned ways of measuring image quality or thought about ways of measuring image quality or describing a set of images in terms of, I don't know, their power spectrum, you know, take a Fourier decomposition. All these things are very informative about what's going on in the images, right? Big question is, what do, what do the robot overlords think makes an image looks good, right? What is it that our, our machine learning networks are picking up on that allow them to do this segmentation well? What are the critical features? Is it something that we can get at through Fourier decomposition? I have no idea. Probably not. Is it something that I can infer by looking at it? Can I look at a synthetic image and say, hey, this synthetic image doesn't look like that there are many ways I can tell right off the bat, it doesn't look like that real eye. And so it's probably a poor reproduction that won't help segmentation, won't help me train a network to segment. But guess what? That's a bad metric. Human vision is not a good metric. It's probably unreliable because I can imagine a situation where I create a whole pool of synthetic images that look nothing like eyes, that maybe have a dark spot where the pupil is and a bunch of noise elsewhere to convince the network that that's not helpful. Right? I can think of very abstract images that, might, that I might be able to use to train a network to get this task done, but that, um, uh, that don't look anything like human eyes to me. And if that's true, that means that just looking at images and trying to decide what looks good and what doesn't and correcting it by improving your blender pipeline, like the one we have, maybe is misguided. And so a critical question in using machine learning, uh, synthetic images and machine learning to do a task like this is, how do you improve the image training set to solve this, what's called the sim to real problem? And, um, and I, don't, I don't have a great answer yet. And I don't think, uh, I think the, the field is still trying to figure this out. So I'm gonna move on. Um, we've improved our networks. Our networks now deal with occlusion. Again, I'm skipping around for the sake of time. Um, this is uh, our latest network applied to uh, a novel context. This is called LSEG. Um, this was published in 2022, last year, developed more in 2021. I think we finished training in 2021. So it does much better. The nice thing is it also, um, well, so we've improved. One of the critical questions 
uh, that you might ask if you're someone like me that uses eye trackers in your research is, all right, first, let's, let's be square. No one cares about IOU unless you're doing machine learning. What does IOU mean? Does it tell you how well your eye, how accurate your eye tracker is going to be? No. Um, if you use an eye tracker, the metric you care about is degrees of visual error. That is, if I'm actually looking over there, but my eye tracker says I'm looking over here, well, that's 10 degrees off. That's 10 degrees of visual error, angular error, right? That's the metric that people who use eye trackers care about. You only get that sort of metric if you then take the additional step of passing your detected feature into a gaze mapper that converts it into an, an angular estimate from pupil position in the image, X and Y pixels, to uh, gaze direction in visual degrees relative to zero, zero, whatever that is, right? Okay. So Kevin Barkovich, hi, Kevin, put quite a lot of time into trying to measure um, to understand how IOU contributes to overall uh, gaze accuracy. And you know the way we did that is we had a large grid of points that we presented one at a time to the observer. They looked at each point and um, we measured, we passed the feature detector, I'm sorry, passed the pupil detection through an algorithm for um, gaze mapping. And we did this for many different machine learning based methods of pupil detection. Some that we developed, some that other labs have since developed because I got jealous of how great we were doing. Um, and what we found is, first of all, uh, one of the real take home of this, again, I'm going to skip around a bit for time, is that our network in this very controlled context, we used VR as the, the, um, as the input image stream. So that, think about VR. It's a controlled light source, right? Your head's in a little black box. There's an infrared illuminator in there. You're not getting all those ambient reflections or ambient infrared light. It's kind of an ideal situation to track gaze. <laughs> and so for that reason, um, the major influence of machine learning was dropout rate in that uh, when you used, so that this is the native um, algorithm is something that the people labs native algorithm, what comes with their software. If you use different machine learning algorithms, the biggest benefit is that you're reducing the number of frames you're losing, right? The native algorithm is losing up to 7% of all frames uh, in this context. And ours was reducing that um, to below 2% or about 2.5%. It did affect accuracy as well. Um, sometimes it produced, uh, it did affect accuracy well, it improved accuracy, but okay. I'm going to jump to the end of the, 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 the last section of the talk. So we tried a few different ways to improve the generalizability of our models, right? Um, at some point, as we were, we finished a project, my collaborators and I got together and asked, all right, so what next? Clearly, there are some limitations in the approaches we're taking now, and we could continue to refine our models to address this issue of generalizability. We could generate more training data. We could increase the quality and utility of synthetic imagery. We could try, um, I haven't said it yet, but we could try reducing processing latency because all of our models, none of them are really optimized for time and can be used in real time with an eye tracker, right? This is stuff where you have to collect your eye images and then um, convert it into a gaze estimate offline, which is very useful in some, some cases, but not all. Or we can improve algorithms for mapping image features to gaze direction, all sorts of stuff. But in the several years, um, uh, three years, four years in which that represents, that his work represents, is four years of work, a lot in the field has changed as well. Um, challenges that weren't quite as pressing when we began this work became, started to uh, become a lot more important. So for example, AR and VR headsets have started to get so much more thin that eye cameras can no longer go in a nice convenient location kind of in front of the eye where they get a nice image of the pupil. Now we have to move these eye cameras really almost to the side of the eye, almost so they're looking at the side of the eye because the optics of that VR headset are just too close. There's no room either for putting a mirror or anything in there to help get a better image of the eye. So now we, we aren't maybe even able to see the pupil directly like we have in the past. Um, also, if we're trying to build an eye tracker that will be relevant in a few years, we have to realize that in some of my studies when I'm collecting mobile eye tracking data, we actually strapped the laptop on the pupil's back Right? That's kind of a common practice because you need the computing power and the hard drive 
to save those I images and map gaze. And it's not great, but it, you know, it's good enough for the time. We're, we're not, we're, we're moving beyond that, right? And so, um, and especially if you think about what's going to happen with the next, next generation AR VR headsets, even the Apple Vision Pro has already been released. It runs on batteries and has eye tracking. Don't quite know what they're doing yet, but the idea is that the power budget become much more important and without a tethered computer tower or laptop, there's much less computational power. So we really need to start taking that into account. So we're starting to play with a new type of sensor. And I, to motivate what the new type of sensor is, first I have to characterize existing sensors and how they're limited. So if you're using like a CMOS sensor, right, and you're trying to collect movements of the eye at a high frame rate, right, you can represent, I'm going to call that a frame-based sensor. And here I'm going to show just a frame-based sensor taking images of an artificial eye rotating back and forth at one hertz. That's one image per second. And only one hertz here because uh, it's easy for me to represent on a time series visually. No other reason. Um, the field width is 1280 pixels by 720 pixels in height. So if we have six seconds and six images, think about the number of pixels being transferred for that for a binocular eye tracker. That would mean that we're collecting at 200 hertz, we're operating 200 hertz. That's over a billion pixels per second for two eyes operating at this resolution. And for if you're imaging something like this, where what's of interest is clearly occupying only a portion of the whole frame, many of those pixels are going to be completely irrelevant. We don't care about it. Which means that this whole um, pipeline of image capture and then even image processing later is going to devote a lot of energy to uninformative pixels. It's very energy inefficient, and it's going to be um, resource inefficient down the line. And so this is a frame-based recording. I know the camera's a little out of focus. Forgive us. And this is a recording uh, of the same artificial eye from a new type of sensor called an event-based sensor. So event-based sensors don't operate like conventional sensors. They don't collect images at a time at all. Instead, their pixels can activate asynchronously. And the time at which they activate and transmit information about what's going on in the world is completely driven by what's happening in the scene. So at every pixel, there's, uh, every pixel operates on a threshold. If there's a change in luminance at that pixel, then the pixel will transmit. Sorry, a change in luminance above a threshold, then the pixel will transmit. It'll transmit either a positive or negative sign. That's it. Either luminance increased or decreased above the threshold. Every pixel is uh, filtering in this way in real time in analog right behind a C the CMOS sensor. So the computer is not involved in that filtering process, meaning it's not burdened with that filtering process in ter terms of resources. This is incredibly energy e uh, e efficient. It uses a fraction of the power of a CMOS sensor. And What's really critical about it is, in this case, right? it's only telling you about change where it matters, at the edges of this thing that's moving that you care about. So you're only transmitting a fraction of the pixels across the whole field. Here's a, uh, to, to characterize, to provide some more information about this, right? here's the same six second time series, the same eye rotating back and forth. And what you see here is every dot is actually every 100th event. So this, uh, we only showed every hundredth event because if we showed every event that was triggered by the movement of this eye, this would be too dense to really see what's going on. Here's a every event within 100 milliseconds. This is a zoom in on some portion of this rotation. So what I'm trying to show here is that there are two important properties of event sensors. One is that they're temporally really dense. Because of this filtering process, they can collect events or, or pixel activations, right? at a really, really, really high temporal rate. Second of all, they're spatially sparse. So you see the events are only happening where the movement occurs and not anywhere else. Hi, Abhishan. This is Abhishan. Abhishan's been working in my lab uh, since May trying to wrangle the hardware here. This is our event sensor with uh, some optics in front of it, a, a lens in front of it. Um, We've got a, uh, and here are the two, the two computer screens, uh, one showing a frame-based image and one showing the event-based data stream. 
Um, I, we're playing with structured light as well, though, uh, with in conjunction with the sensors. I'm not going to talk about that much today because that work is really in premature or immature. Well, and then there's a frame camera here um, that we got from the. It operates at like 200 hertz or more if you use a subset of. <laughs> Here's um. So one of the things Kamran has been doing is figuring out how to temporally synchronize these two sensors. And this is important because um, if we're going to use machine learning to operate on this sort of data stream, we need a way to train the network, right? Remember that a, an ingredient of training a network to say identify the pupil is you need to pass in ground truth data, tell it where the pupil actually is during the training session. And um, we don't want to manually label where all the, the pupils are. So one way to bootstrap to make progress without having to manually label all those images is apply our already trained networks like LSEG to this frame and then use that since it's spatially registered, we're gonna use, we're gonna spatially register it with this in, uh, event stream. We can use this as a training data to train a network to find a pupil in the event stream. The assumption being that later on, it will be able to identify pupils in the event stream without any frames to help it. Right. So, um, uh, so that's the general approach we're taking, right? By uh, so again, you're imaging scientists. So let me just say, I know that. Um, how many of you have played with checkerboard uh, geometric camera calibration before? Wave a checkerboard in front of a camera. Just a few of you. Good, but at least some of you. We need to make sure that's in our curriculum. Um, so if you got two cameras. Right, one you and you want to know which, which if I pick a pixel in this image, I want to know what pixel in this image corresponds to that same point in the world. Requires that we calibrate the two cameras or register the two images. So Abhijan's been working hard on that problem as well by waving tiny, cute little checkerboards on popsicle sticks in front of the cameras. Right. All right. So I'm wrapping up, but uh. Right, so let me just tell you some of the problems we're encountering using these event streams. Um, so uh, first of all, the eye, it moves in strange ways. It's characterized by lots of sudden movements, saccades, followed by periods of uh, relatively still movement where the eye is not moving, that's a fixation. And of course, since the event sensor is kind of a change detector, right, detects change in luminance, um, you don't get many events when the eye is still. So um, you can turn up the sensitivity of the sensor, but then why not? You might as well be using a frame-based sensor, right? You lose all the spatial sparsity that makes this thing attractive in the first place. One way to approach this problem is by using, um, by taking inspiration from biology. So we're going to be start playing with what's called a spiking neural nets. Spiking nets are different than typical machine learning networks because, well, they they're kind of trained to, they're designed to work like neurons. Um, if you guys have taken my vision class, some of you might remember the way, um, what happens at, a, at the, the soma of an interneuron. It's gonna have lots of presynaptic neurons that are voting through chemical and electrical transmission, right? Through the release of neurotransmitters to try and get this thing to either um, reach an action potential or not. That involves a process of temporal summation. You think about it like a moving temporal window where um, all these presynaptic neurons are causing depolarization over time. And if that depolarization reaches a threshold, then you get an action potential. But if it doesn't, nothing happens. Okay, why is this relevant to machine learning? Because listen, if we pass this image with spatial sparsity into a convolutional net, into a traditional convolutional neural network, you guys know what convolution is now, right? I know you guys learned about that in, in signal in image processing. Um, it's going to convolve across every aspect of every portion of the image, and that's incredibly inefficient. Remember, we had spatial sparsity, and that was really nice. If we go convolve across the whole image, we're losing that. And so um, what's, if we then, instead, we pass it into a network where uh, instead of convolving the image, what's happening is the input layer, the network is deciding whether or not to transmit past the input layer at a, whether or not, um, that's right, I just say this. Um, for every pixel in the event stream, it's transmitting spikes, right? And what's happening is the spikes are all, I lost the slide. I did lose the slide. 
Right, so we're using spiking neural nets because it preserves the spatial sparsity and temporal um, density of the original input image. And it doesn't, uh, it won't process in portions of the image where nothing's going on. It's really the, the moral of the story. Okay. All right. So I should wrap up. Um, again, I mentioned there are lots of collaborators involved in many years of work here. So uh, um, I, here I just want to acknowledge them. All these are students. Um, roughly almost in temporal, um, except for Abhijan, who's out of time sequence, almost in, in, in a time series. And then all the faculty members on the bottom. OK. Um, thanks, guys. All right, so I don't have any questions. And if you need to leave now, I won't be offended. Yep. Well, eyelids, uh, eyelash, uh, I think eyelash is a more relevant thing. I, I mean, it's clear I can't get rid of eyelids, um, but maybe you want to say more about what you're thinking. Of. Yeah. Um, I don't know to any wavelengths of light. In infrared, the sclera is very reflective. Um, and of course, the pupil's super trans transparent, transmissive, or else we wouldn't see anything. So uh, um, yeah, the, the eyelid is a big, kind of a big problem, except um, only when it's partially occluding the pupil. Luckily, you know, people, for obvious reasons, we, we only care about um, tracking gaze when, he, when the pupil's not obscured, because then people aren't getting any information about the world anyway. Who cares where they're looking? Um, so the eyelashes, though, can get in the way of the pupil even when people are getting meaningful visual information about the world, because some people have really big eyelashes. And you know, again, if we want to use an eye tracker in all cases when people are walking around the world, then we want it to be able to work when people put on mascara. Right, um, and that makes eyelashes big and thick and get in the way. Yeah. Yeah, that would be beneficial. Um, so I've actually been asking myself this lately, just and, and we've spoken about this before. Jeff and I have spoken about this. Um, I don't quite know the context and and to what degree anyone's ever challenged. Uh, the use of almost all eye tracking is done at around 830 to 850 nanometers. Um, and it, the question is, did we just settle on that because that's what the first people did back in the 1950s? Or um, we certainly don't want to be in the visible range, but there's a lot of stuff outside visible, a lot of wavelengths we can use outside visible that might emphasize differences between the different parts of the eye and maybe have some, you know, provide some transparency. Um, so it's a good question, and I don't know that anyone's really dug deep. What's that? <laughs> yes. I agree. I think that's. Yeah. Um, so it, it depends on what type. Yes. The answer is yes. Um, but they can be, their accuracy can be degraded. So when you wear corrective lenses, I mean, the pupil is underneath refractive, even without lenses, underneath um, ref layers that refract, right? Um, so if the eye, and that's not a problem if the pupil is looking directly at the camera, the eye camera, but as it moves further away from the eye camera, you get greater amounts of refraction. So more recent gaze mapping models have started to build in parameters to account for gaze angle dependent refraction of the pupil between the eye camera and, and, and the pupil. Um, they, the only ones I've seen haven't done it very well yet. And uh, presumably, if that's a free parameter that's kind of fit, 
then you could account for different amounts of refraction. Uh, but glasses are a lot harder than contacts, right? For just because of, uh, they can be a lot harder, but you can always try and put the eye camera between the glasses and, um, and the eye to avoid the problem with glasses. With contacts, we tend to track anyway with contacts in my lab in practice. We don't, we don't care because, you know, it, it doesn't introduce so much error above the pretty noisy track anyway that we care. Um, yes. Not, no, they're very expensive and difficult to manufacture. And so I think the, the quick answer is no. No, not that I know of. Bartek, did you have a question? Yeah. So PT actually does the default result because PT is a variant of the We use both. Um, yep. And, and in fact, both of them have problems, right? Even your, your TSNE or, or uh, dimensionality reduction. You don't know how to interpret the. Um, this is a good offline conversation, but I don't like either of them. I think they both have enough problems that I don't really care which one we use. They're both kind of vaguely helpful, but um, come with big caveats. So. Okay. We, we should talk about this offline. Um, that'd be helpful to get other perspectives. Cool. Okay, that sounds great. Um, thanks, Bartek. I'd love to talk to you about that. That'd be great. Jim. Yes. They don't. Yes. Yes. Um, we we have um, we we dabbled in that, and I think that line of work we probably won't continue to pursue temporal stuff beyond very small amounts of time. Um, so the issue is saccades. When you initiate a saccade, the velocity profile is very predictable. If I see the first eighth of a saccade, um, the acceleration profile, I can probably predict where it's going to land um, because they're ballistic. Once they initiate, they're very ballistic, um, and there's a strong relationship between its acceleration and its distance. Um, so the problem is that that's only true of saccades. I can, we've all been in staring contests before, right? I can hold fixation arbitrarily long and very quickly switch to a saccade just because I want to. It's very under volitional control, right? And so um, predicting transitions like that is pretty much impossible. If we knew something like, uh, and, and if you want to do it at all, right, why, uh, if you wanted to predict why, when I transition from fixation to saccade to smooth pursuit, I would have to know something about the outside world too, because my choices about when I saccade or fixate are largely driven by the type of task I'm trying to complete. So if I'm in a museum, I might make long fixations to admire different parts of that artwork. But if I'm in the middle of a game of ultimate Frisbee, right, uh, I, my head and eyes are going to be whipping all over the place. Like the statistics of my eye movements are going to be completely different driven by that task. So it becomes a very hairy problem. And, uh, and I, we, as a lab, have, have, uh, my thought is it's, it's too hairy to really want to delve into. I'd rather try and develop a system that can do the best it can based on instantaneous what happened now or in the past few tens of milliseconds.
take a gradual accumulation of these right here. Right? Gradual accumulation of right here. And then over time, that's what you're seeing is like a steady line. So you draw a tiny line, and then it's still on that very same line. It's a different, yeah, it serves a different purpose than I think what Jim is getting at, but but it is certainly does do a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of time in there. Yeah. Um, they can play a large role. Believe it or not, it's harder when you're in the near infrared. Um, so the 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 thing that makes your iris more brown colored is melanin. It's the same stuff that makes your skin uh, change um, tone too. And uh, if there's, it's actually helpful if there's more melanin when you look at um, in, under infrared light, you have brown eyes, the, the boundary between the iris and, this, and the pupil is more pronounced. But people's blue eyes tend to be harder to track because the blue eye doesn't have as much contrast against the pupil. So it is definitely, again, we spoke about um, a, a smart thing to do uh, would be to, to take a hyperspectral sensor and just wave it across the portion of the eye and, and see if we can just do what the remote sensing group does um, for lots of their tasks, right? Figure out how to maximize separability of the different classes in the image, uh, maximize segmentation performance. Um, if I had all the time in the world and I would do that. Yes. Yeah, so um, in terms of power efficiency, if you measure just like the milliwatt, or the, the, the amount of power drawn for imaging the same scene. Um, now, you, there, are, there are settings. And so, and of course, there are settings for traditional sensors too, exposure time, um, but and ISO. But uh, yeah, it, it's a fraction of the power. I don't have the, the numbers available. It also, but let's, let's be square, right? I mean, it depends how you use the sensor. Right here, not very spatially sparse, and it's so temporal, temporally dense. Depends. It also depends what you're imaging. So, um, we kind of, you know, created a, a really um, cherry picked a context in which to demonstrate the benefits of a uh, an event center here, because it was a smooth, featureless background where nothing is moving, and then a a clear foreground target that was moving a lot. And so we really made it. We we really uh, made it a context where it's easy to show that hey, the event sensor is only going to track what matters. But in in other contexts, if you're trying to track, you know, if you put it on the front of a car, it may not be quite as. Um, there may be other contexts where that's not true. So you have to choose your your. your um, people do use event sensors. That being said, people do use event sensors in autonomous vehicles um, for autonomous navigation. Um, it's one of the use cases that the companies are, the event sensor manufacturers are, are really playing up to. So, um, it is. I, I should say the event sensor, the whole idea of the event sensor actually came from vision scientists in the late eighties. They, uh, and it was designed based on the retina. And so this idea of, you know, invoking the action potential as a way to process and, and represent what happens at the, uh, event is is um it's appropriate Um, you sorry, utilizing what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's that's our approach. Yeah, we're 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 
uh, using pre-trained models on a frame-based images that have been registered with the event stream so that we can train models to do stuff on the event stream using the ground truth from the real images. So I think it's exactly what you're saying. Yes. Oh, okay. It's not a bad idea, but we are moving away from standard sensors, and so we won't be able to pursue it. Um, but yeah, there's it's 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 such a wide open area. There's so many good ideas like that one that that we'd love to pursue. But um, I think we're gonna put our resources into event sensors now. Um, so we're not really worried about that yet, but the but I will say in speculation that I mean your phone has spiking neural nets in it. I've been told. So um, yes, there are, and and you can get specific hardware meant to uh, that that is meant to uh, be like a, a a framework to execute these these networks spiking neural nets. Um, so uh, there there is I, I see solutions down the line, but we're so early in. I'm not really worried about integrating it to a VR headset yet. We first need to develop the algorithms. By the time we're done, I'm sure the landscape will have changed completely. So, they they already have the three. You saw the the sensor. The... Yeah, getting much smaller. They're not small enough yet to integrate. CPU. They're like millimeter, three millimeters by three millimeters now. The sensors. Yeah, you think? Oh, right, we got to talk talk more. Jeff, you got high. Uh, but it's changing. It's it's just a lot of. Anyhow, I it's four thirty eight, so we should really wrap up. Um, so I'll stick around. I guess there are cookies and coffee outside, and so I will go hang out there if anyone wants to continue the chat. Thank you very much.